Hello, Sense of Things. It's Jeff and Ron here again, and we have a week where lots of craziness went on this week. Certainly, we're not a political show, but we have to mention a little bit about the the House and the Speaker and all that kind of good stuff. Some economic data, and then Ron's got some good stuff off of a webinar he had earlier this month, or I think late last month. Ron, good morning, bud. Good morning. Yeah, actually, it's interesting you were talking about, yeah, I hate talking politics. Uh, It's brutal. But the interesting thing is, they said by ousting the speaker, there's a 95 to 99% chance November 17th, the government will shut down. Yeah. So look, you could say some of that's going to be baked into the market or whatever. Mm -hmm. But as we get closer, and it becomes a reality, it will Mm -hmm. absolutely affect what's going on and you're getting the extremists. I don't want to say where they are, but you're getting the extremists that are literally drawing a line in the sand and it's not going to, it's when they're not going to, they're not going to capitulate. Yeah. And yeah, it's just, it's crazy. And it's a what show at this point. So I think I, with my clients, we buckled down. It was interesting that the trading strategy that I use, it signaled the hell out of like way risk off at the beginning of this month. And so I will either look like a hero or a zero. uh, for my clients. I will say, and it's certainly not to pat myself on the back or toot my own horn, because I certainly never, you know, you never want to see the market go down. But what's happening right now in September and October, we saw this the end of last year, Yeah, you know, as far as Flat to negative for the year. As a matter of fact, if you pull out the top eight stocks, the S and P five hundred is negative now for the yeah. year. Yeah, yeah so, I was listening to that the equal weights down. I think five percent or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I didn't see that much, but it doesn't matter. It's still negative. Yeah. But I still think we may get a end of the year bump. Mm. But we all know how things are, right? You take the escalator up and the elevator down. And if things truly accelerate, because the S&P is now trading again under the uh, 200-day moving average, and Mm -hmm. if it does it for another day or two, today and tomorrow, I think we're looking at another 5 to 8% fairly quickly, Mm -hmm. because that's what happens. We go to the downside quickly, we go up, we melt up slowly. And I think we could see that into the Thanksgiving timeframe, which would kind of ride right into the government shutdown. And Mm -hmm. we may get a pop in December, a Santa Claus rally. And for anybody that doesn't know what the Santa Claus rally is, that means it's a rally the last five days of the year and the first two days of the next year. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll see that. But I think we need a whoosh up to that point. Yeah. But how far does it go down before we see that little bounce back up? And I think, yeah, for me, there's some big headwinds. Although I think our government is dysfunctional most of the time anyhow, it's just going to be more dysfunctional. At this point, because whoever ends up in there at Speaker of the House, they're never going to please everybody. And it's just, it's a what show when it comes to that. So I think there's some headwinds there. I think people got their first, their first bill for their education. Some of, some of these people have never seen that bill before and are, you know, getting that. And of course the administration's trying to do a whole bunch of stuff again, which is just, okay, you got slapped down once and you just ignored it. So that, I think people, from what I'm seeing, people are just looking at it and going, oh, they'll, they're, the government's going to do something to eliminate this. And I, I just don't see that happening uh, for the vast majority of people that are out there. So I think there's a massive amount of headwinds. I would have told you, and I, I may culpa when I said that I thought we'd have a decent backside of the year, but uh, you were right a couple months ago. We, I, I personally see a lot of headwinds coming in right now, and I think it's time to be a little cautious. But here's the interesting yeah. thing. There's nothing new that no. we haven't spoken about as far as headwinds Oops. since April that you and I started doing this. There's nothing new. As a matter of fact, probably people are like, oh, they're talking about this stuff again. It's yeah. nothing. It's nothing new. Just things have either accelerated or have come to the surface with headlines more so with uh, some of the media outlets. That's all. I, I think my funniest one. I was listening to the news when I was driving out to get coffee this morning, and they were talking that this week we they saw the I forget what they call it. The it's basically the tape or something like that that they call it where they look at 
what the estimates are of the Fed with rates and things like that. Right. And people were shocked this week that it's very unlikely that there isn't going to be like six or seven drops in interest rates next year. Okay, what the hell did you think? <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, I heard some schmuck. If I wish I could remember his name, I know he was from Bank of America, so it doesn't surprise me. He actually came out last week and said he's expecting a rate cut before year end. <laughs> and I'm thinking, how, how many who's Fed pay, governors who's paying him to say this? Yeah, literally, how many Fed governors? And I watch the Fed governors extensively. Every one, I don't think there is a one of them that I've seen or heard who hasn't said, yeah, we're still not, we're still thinking inflation's there and we're still going to raise rates. And they feel like they've got cover for it right now. Yeah, Meester came out Loretta last week and basically said, yeah, I mean, they don't anticipate yeah. lowering rates until the summer next year. Now, yeah. obviously this is just normal course of action. This has nothing to do if there's a catalyst in a geopolitical event, which is always our yeah. hedge and our caveat to whatever we say there, but to the normal course of action, if things progress, things are only going to get worse before they get better. Yeah. Things are going to get worse before they get better. They're they're, dumb. they're not going to raise rates, uh, lower rates until next summer. Yeah. And that's what's on the agenda. And that's what they've been saying. Why are people saying, and I know we've said this a few times, oh, you got to look through that. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> they were saying at the earliest is July. So this was the, what whatever they were talking about this morning, this was their, we were shocked that they said shocked. that it probably won't be until July. Why would you be shocked? They have all been saying that. Neil Cash Carey, every single time he has spoken for the last eight months, yes. has said exactly the same thing. Yeah, and he's also one of the first Fed governors, at least that I heard, that admitted that they all were thought and were hoping that inflation was transitory and they were yeah. late, they were late to raise. So he yeah. was the I'm sure the other some other ones have said it, but he was the one that I thought was early. And mm -hmm. often that he was stating that. So yeah. riding the whole thought of does it make sense? Uh, let me have some fun here. A couple of slides. And I've done this just to let you know. I've done these two slides essentially. Every speaking event, almost every seminar. And recently with the last two webinars that I did over the last eight plus years or so, maybe nine years at this point. Mm -hmm. And every year I update it. I update the information. So, Jeffy, what does it cost to make a penny? Probably. Now, mind you, a penny is worth one cent. I just wanted cent. to put that out there. One penny. Yes. What does he think I'm it costs? I'm going to say a, a dollar at least. Okay. No, come on. Stop. Not that much. Okay. Not that much. All right. I'm, 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 I just am dispassionate about the government doing anything. Okay. So it costs 2.27 cents to make a penny. Make a penny. Doesn't right. cost a dollar. I'm just saying it costs more than twice as twice of what it's worth to make it. Make now, it. now, what does it cost to make a nickel? At that rate, I'd say what about seven and a half cents? Okay, mind you, a nickel is worth five cents. I just want yep. to put that out there. Yep. So the cost of making a nickel is 10.4 cents to make a nickel. What? Gee, we have a deficit in the United States? Yeah. How do we, we have a deficit? I don't, I don't get it. Okay, now just- now well, with the velocity of money, now we start using all these economic terms. With the velocity of money, how much money does that nickel make over time? Actually, that nickel declines in value every single year with inflation, so- Okay, and just for some craps and giggles, it only costs five cents to make a dime, 11.11 .11 cents to make a quarter, and we're getting a bang for the buck, no pun intended, to make a dollar. It only costs, that. It costs so, less to make a dollar than yeah. it does to make a nickel. So why on earth are we still using dimes, like pennies and nickels and all that stuff? It's just, it doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> I don't know. Listen, I... For the most part, I never pull money out of my wallet. I'm using my credit yep. card for all my charges. I still have a coin dispenser to make the rolls. I can't remember the last time I actually put coins in the damn thing because yeah. I never pay with cash. 
Sure. So actually, when I was in Australia 21 years ago, we were paying like they did away with the penny like years yeah. before. So whatever it is, they just round up, round down and throw it. Forget. I don't know how that impacts them with taxes because it's got to yeah. add up. But yeah, they did away with the penny years ago. Well, when we were in uh, London in uh, February of this year, th I mean, they don't use money. I mean, it was funny because I got off the plane and I was like, okay, just so that we have some money when we're getting there or when we're getting into town and all that, I ran and got like a hundred pounds out. And I had that same hundred pounds when I left 10 days later, seven days later, because yeah. they don't use cat. They don't use money at all. They use Google. It, everything they yeah. do is Google now with the, your Google the, phone. The, the, the digital pay on the phone. Google, yeah, the pay, Google pay, Apple Pay. They don't even, I mean, it's funny because I'm like, I'm so used to going there, getting an Oyster card, which is their, their subway card for London. And right. so we got Oyster cards and then I'm watching and everybody's just walking by, just swiping their phone. And so they don't even use, they don't charge you more if you use your phone than if you do an Oyster card, which it used to be the deal. So I was like, man, it's way, that converted me. I now use Google Pay for everything because I was like, that was awesome. <laughs> the, the only problem that I've always had with those things, like I do with other things that are, like even sporting events and concerts, I'm going to one on Monday. They want to scan the code on your phone. Sure. Now. What if you lose your phone, break your phone, or your battery dies? Mm -hmm. How do you now prove I just paid a thousand dollars for two tickets? Yeah. What well, are you going to do there? So that's why I print out paper. Listen, don't laugh. So when I travel on the airline, I never use the mobile app. I print oh, out I my either. boarding pass and I go up there. And I, I know I'm so OG, but at the end of the day, I like that piece of paper. I like. I feel well, like you know, I mean, the other part guy, is get like off my lawn, but it works. Too many times I've gone up there and tried to use that thing. And either my phone decides that it wants to lock the screen. So I'm like scrambling to do all that, or it won't read the screen because it's right. too reflective. So yeah, I did. I don't, yeah, I'm a paper guy. I just print it out and give them the paper when I travel. So. All right. So you're all right. So I don't feel so bad. There's one other no. person that does it besides me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I got a couple other things getting okay. to some good stuff here. I know you got something on jolts. This is probably yeah. a modification. I thought this was interesting. I actually had heard a couple of commentators talking about this. I found this from your Denny's newsletter that I get, okay. uh, who always has some good stuff. And I thought this was interesting that every time you saw a pullback in the job openings, you usually saw a precipitous drop later on and or a recession coming. But I thought not necessarily the job openings was the more interesting things. It was the quits. Mm. Yeah, I don't get it. With We already talked about this. The credit card balance is breaching a trillion. Savings rate near an all-time low. Mm -hmm. Our rates are through the roof. Credit card rates are now averaging 21%. And, uh, oh, by the way, student loans, they got to start paying them back this month. And people are quitting their job. Now, yeah. if they're quitting their job and the job openings are going down, does that mean they just left the workforce? Mm -hmm. hey, look, we could go, every chart we show every week has some kind of an ominous overtone that kind of goes into our echo chamber thought process. But I just thought, I thought this was interesting. Just look, you got to, you got to follow trends. And if you notice these trends are not transitory either, they run its course over a period of time in one direction. I think I don't even need to bring it up, but Jolts really jumped up. It's that little juice or the little pop up that you see on the the end of the the blue chart. There went up almost a million from the private or previous month, uh, up to nine point six million. A lot more job openings now. Part of that's probably seasonal coming on. I think that's part of the issue is you've got seasonal employment coming on this time of year. Yeah, I, I've noticed. I walked into a Walmart and. They had a little sign saying, hey, we're hiring seasonal employees and things like that. Right next lines. to the Christmas decorations in October, probably. Well, that's probably it. Yeah. It was all that part of it where we just skip that. We don't even go to Thanksgiving anymore. We just go from like July 4th to Christmas and exactly and just get going, try and push that Christmas season. Got to get to Black Friday. Yeah, exactly. And Black Friday is going to end up being like October 15th now. I think going into it. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting to see that. I know you had seen some things about the, the jolts numbers not necessarily telling. So I have a feeling right. my myself, I feel like it's probably seasonal employment, but I think behind the scenes, there's decreases across the board in, in some other areas.
I agree. I agree. So I got two other slides here, yeah. one on the, the treasury. I have been talking about this actually with a couple other advisor friends of mine, <clears throat> when it was hovering 420, 430. And I'm like, if this thing breaches four or five, mm -hmm. we're going to get to five pretty quickly. Yeah. And just as it was getting to four or six, we talked about this last week, Jamie Diamond's talking about look for six or 7%. I've heard somebody else talk about double digits on 10 year. Now that's mm -hmm. the only, I only heard that once. This wasn't from a group of the, the competent people that I follow, but my God, if we hit six or 7% on the 10 year mm -hmm. with everything that people in our generation have seen in the last 25 years, people are going to yank money out of the equity market yeah. and just put 15, 30, 50 percent of their money in a 10 year at five or six plus percent mm -hmm. it's risk-free and they're just going to sit back yeah. and get it and they're going to sleep like a baby so that well, means it, if they're going to yank money out of the equity market market's got to go down right you're selling off yeah interesting i one of my bigger clients we were talking about this he, he called me because he's hey i got this thing he's got a lot of cash and hey i have this thing from chase where they I guess they were offering like a 4.5% rate on savings. And I was like, well, you can do better outside of that through your brokerage account. But yeah, now all of a sudden, all those rates where they were paying like 2% and all that, I think they've come to the realization that they've got to jack up their their rates, which that it, it affects their net interest margin because they can only go so far on the mortgages. And then yeah. now they're cutting into net interest margin on the banks, which I think has some it's gonna. It, it's not a good situation for the banks because if they're competing with treasuries or whatever, they need that money to be able to offer mortgages. And if they, you know, if the money's leaving the banks and going other places like treasuries, that's not good. So they've got to cut into their net interest margin to get that. Yep. I have my next slide actually is on mortgage applications, but okay. riding the coattails of what you're saying. The shock of 2022, the market being down 20%, the mm -hmm. mark, the bond market just absolutely getting crushed. There was a four to five month lag effect before Silicon Valley Bank and two other banks basically had too much risk on the back end of the yield curve and yep. they got crushed because yields were going up and asset values were going down. If the 10 year has already breached four, mm -hmm. All right. And look how quickly it breached four from the bottom of 2020. Yeah. And now we're hitting five. That yeah, means we're only going to accelerate to six or seven faster, which yeah. means the asset prices with the yields going up, the asset prices on those, especially the back end treasuries are going to go down. Mm. These banks are going to have to restate the value of this stuff on their balance sheet. Sure. We're going to see more bankruptcies. We're going to see more failures. We mm. have to. Obviously, the government's going to come in and backstop something again, but this has got to have a contagion effect. So real well, quick, and, and then and I know they'll, they'll backstop yeah. the big banks, but they're not going to backstop the small, you know, the regionals and things like that. Silicon Valley Bank was the 16th largest bank. They were about 20% yeah. the size of JP Morgan, the largest, mm -hmm. right? We know that we know, and actually I was just talking with somebody the other day about this. I truly believe the top three banks, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, and JP Morgan, they're more important than the government. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the government, will, number one, will not allow them to fail because you got to think about the deposits, how many people have their money there. Think about all the tentacles of the other services that the bank does with mm -hmm. investments and hedging and commodities and wealth management, what well, we do and everything yeah, else. Yeah. Not, I, not know, to Yeah. Not to mention that they're probably the most widely held for business banks. They are two most, yeah. big to fail. They're, they're more important than the government, yep. those top three banks. So look at the mortgage applications, lowest than 30 years. Mm -hmm. And the rates aren't, and, and the 10 year and the, the Fed rate isn't even at its high over the last 30 years, but the mortgage applications are now time low. And mm -hmm. another reason versus 30 years ago is because more than, what do they say, 70 or 80% of the mortgages out there are under, so people aren't selling. They're not mm -hmm. moving and people aren't. And right now, what is a uh, mortgage rate? Seven, six, seven, eight. Yeah. 7.6, 7.8. So yeah, I thought that this was uh, interesting here with all the mortgage originators reporting basically at a 30 year low. Yeah. That's amazing. 
All right. What do you got? We talked about it, but let me give you just a quick little update on what I had on for today. Yeah. Nope. I don't want that. Eventually we're going to show a really good chart that it gets going to get everybody all excited. Yeah. Just unfortunately doing. they haven't been real good here lately. So along those lines, we got a pretty shocker of an ADP un or an employment report this week. Only 89,000 jobs, way below consensus, almost half at that point, below the consensus range and everything else. So that was a bit of a shocker. And once again, you get this, you, okay, the JOLTS number looks good, but then the employment report, and I tend to put more credence on the employment report, although this is ADP and they tend to be a little funky with their reporting and they've been way less accurate recently, but it was a big shocker this week that was on top of I think it came out right at the same time that the whole Speaker of the House thing happened. And so it just got yeah, got, washed, got washed away. But here's yeah. the funny thing. I like that. Go back. I, I, I think the funny thing about this, how I love just uh, economists yanking uh, numbers out of the rear end. Look at that consensus range. Yeah. Anybody could kick a field goal through that field goal post of 102 to 190 and they were yeah. under that. <laughs> what the hell? What the hell were these analysts even thinking to come up with a range like that? And then they still missed it. And they still are wrong. So. Lucy pulled the ball from Charlie Brown. <laughs> My God. And forget about missing the field goal. They yeah. missed the ball. It's funny because you have. Know, even with the old sense of things show with my my former co-host, we would go through this stuff every week. And I, I used to laugh because at the beginning, when we started doing the show, these ranges were pretty tight and they were missing them, especially during the pandemic. They were missing it all the time. They, were, they would come in with, oh, consensus is 102 to 115. And they the actual number would come in like right. 300. It's what the hell? Where are you? Uh, what numbers are you looking what at? calculator well, now, are you using? Since the pandemic, it's amazing. The consensus range has gotten wider and wider. It's, okay, we can't be wrong. So if we just do 90,000 difference or 88,000 difference, we can't be wrong. You were basically your range, the actual number came in the whole amount of your range there and you were still massively wrong. <laughs> Crazy. It's not. It's All right. Shocking. Anyway. That, well, that was a okay, side so note. we'll end on a good note that actually factory orders for a yeah. for the first time in a long time were a positive number, up 1.2 percent. Now I don't know if this is well. They only uh, had one direction to go after so many months. That I mean, yeah, it's literally been nine months of direct down. So we actually had a positive. Once again, our favorite economists here: everything from negative 0.5 to positive 2.0. Uh, so they pretty much had it and their consensus was 0 0.20 and it came in at 1.2. I, I, I don't know. It's a possible green shoot. Who knows? I don't think they're there yet. I think we got a lot of, we got a lot of headwinds in front of us before we get anywhere close to that, but, but at least something positive out of the factory orders side of the house. Let me ask you this. I had diarrhea of the mouth earlier going on my little rant. What do you see here between let's say now and Thanksgiving? I see a lot of ugly. Really? Uh, like I said, I think my, once again, the proprietary in-house trading software that I use went really risk off. The most I've ever seen it in a month. It went from, okay, we're just a little bit uncomfortable with things. We're neutral to pretty bearish very quickly in less than a month. So that tells me that Things are when, when we start to look at some of the momentum indicators that we use, it's just, I, I don't see good happening. And I think this whole speaker fight, uh, first off, I don't know what idiot's going to want that job because uh, you're never going to be able to actually two that do anything. Stepped up. Yeah. Oh, I know. We've had people step up. Uh, I think they're more stepping up because they're patriots and they want to do it. But the reality is you've got eight goofballs that are in the, the Republican Party that are basically hijacking everything at this point. And you've got such a small margin between everybody and you got a Democratic Senate getting things accomplished and certainly trying to get this debt deals in place. I, I just don't see things being really good from a governmental perspective. Usually I would say shutting the government down is not a bad thing. And I personally think that's the only way that you can actually get anything done because there's no leverage any other way. The, the interesting thing is the only thing I agreed with that came out of the eight bozos was 
we didn't cut we didn't cut enough spending. And you and I have been talking about this forever about cutting spending and redu- and, and, and taking our revenues and putting that to our debt. Yeah, we got to We got to cut that in half or forget about our generation. Next generation's totally screwed. Yeah, they're toast because uh, then our reserve currency will go away and all the other good stuff. But just to be like every time there's a new administration, the other party becomes the party of no. Yeah. The party of disrupt and you'll get nothing. Mm-hmm. Like, well, can't we all get along? There's got to be some compromise here. What about the greater good of the, you know what? How about you put up your job, right? Meaning that you won't get reelected because you want to do something that's right. And yeah. you want to do something that's good for the economy and the greater good and for the next generation. And unfortunately, they're just concerned about being power hungry, being in the spotlight mm-hmm. and uh, whatever the next rung on the ladder they want to climb. And it just seems to me, I think, and I don't want to be on politics the whole time here, but yeah. I it seems to me that it's also the power brokers, the ones that are in power. It's like they keep wanting to push these things off, push it. So you could be working on a lot of these deals throughout the year. Why do we keep running up to these debt limits? I thought the one we had during the summer, that was the solution to everything. And we were going to have until next year before we had to deal with a debt ceiling yeah. limit. And then all of a sudden it's now, oh, we have another debt. You can't run a government that way. You can't run a government that. So I, you well, know, for my- all the strikes. How long did they have to negotiate? Yeah. Now you have the healthcare workers on strike. And then yep. now they're talking about in Vegas, all the culinary people, they're going to go out on strike. No, this is what's going on. It's gonna People be got a- weddings. They got to the F1 coming to Vegas. Yeah. They know, hey, work. they're going to strike when you need us most. Yeah, They're not stupid for yep. uh, their base. But at the end of the day, are you really getting what you want? The auto workers, that's only going to accelerate. As far as the amount of walkouts and whatever, and a lot of these workers, they will not come out, but the underpinnings of their conversations are, they don't believe everything the union wants. They want to work. There can be, there's middle ground. They don't want to say, because this is what's happening. The union has a fund that when you're out of work, we'll still pay you a little bit. Yeah. It's not their salary. It's yeah, they're like not getting. Yeah, it's not like they're just sitting on their butts on the picket lines making their normal salary. It's yeah, it, they're maybe making sixty percent if they're lucky. And the and the old and the the statistic, the statistic that's held true for the last eight or nine years, seventy percent, seventy percent plus or minus percent of Americans don't even have four hundred dollars in their bank yeah. account. Yeah. How many of those people are? auto workers, healthcare mm-hmm. workers, yeah. whoever, culinary workers that you could, they can, you can afford the, you, you could, that the union could tell them, don't go to work. We're going to represent you. And here's a few dollars to put food on your table because they're more than paycheck to paycheck mm-hmm. because they're the ones that have all the credit card debt too. Yeah. Makes well, no it's, s- it, it's so funny to me that the interesting thing is the news is all about the healthcare workers, the, all this stuff. Nobody seems to give a crap about the actors and all that. Writers, yeah. The writers, at least, they they negotiated and got their stuff done. But it literally, you're not hearing anything about the actors because everybody's, I don't really care. They, 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 they were saying the that, first couple of weeks, but after they hit the 100-day mark, yeah. nobody gave a crap. Yeah. Because you know why? I'll tell you why. Because you have Netflix and mm-hmm. Prime and Paramount and Disney Plus. So there was always content for people yep. to watch. They just might not have watched the new late night show yeah. or something new, but there was plenty of content for people to watch. That's why people didn't give a crap. Well, and it's funny because they were saying with, with Netflix, it's accelerated, like the usage of Netflix has accelerated massively during this whole strike because people are like, okay, I'll just start exploring new stuff that's on there or even old stuff. My wife and I do this. An we, old series we watch, you haven't seen yeah, in years. We will, we will watch a, a lot of shows from Europe and from, you yeah, know, specifically from England and, yeah. and the other English speaking countries. And I haven't watched Amer- like regular American TV for probably four years at this point. Cause I, I got tired of it. that has been on American TV other than Yellowstone and a few other programs. You, not that's much, literally not much it. Come out of it. Yeah. And I typically wait. I don't watch it while it's going. I typically wait until it's over a season and then I can binge watch it over a period of time. And that's the way we work now. So I'm assuming other people do the same thing. And so it's less and less people are like, I don't really care because a lot of the stuff that's coming out is just not great. 
at this what point. we should do is in future episodes as we wrap up we should probably come up with one decent series that people may have overlooked on one of these streaming things that they should consider and yep. why acorn tv so mine for the day acorn TV. Oh, that, that's the, the british one, right the, the british they're, they're, ones they're, 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 so, uh, mystery, they're detective uh, series a lot of people like them bingeable series we tend to like the police dramas and stuff like that murdoch um, or so one of the other ones right yeah so we're big fans of murdoch mysteries that's in canada there's 10 okay. seasons of that it's awesome it's late 19 late 1800s time period great one there broken wood mysteries it's a new zealand one so a couple good ones there if, if people like that kind of stuff all right we'll have to do that in some future podcasts yeah absolutely love it all right, guys, thanks a lot for joining us today. Uh, as always, if you, first off, if you've got a great series that you want to share with us, make sure yeah. you put that in the comments. We'd love to have that, and we'll share that with everybody else, too. Give us an upvote if you uh, like what you hear. And in addition to that, make sure you subscribe so that you see these coming out. I did post one the other day, an interview that I did with uh, my friend Damon Thompson. For those of you that are uh, interested in, if you're dealing with, with student loans at this point, Damon and I went through all the programs that are available and what he does, his, the company he works with, that actually does a lot of this stuff for you to figure out which of the 70 programs you could qualify for. So make sure you look that one up. It's on inside there. It's episode 101. Or it's Freedom Day 10 or Sense of Things 10 Damon Thompson. So thanks a lot, and we'll see you guys back here the next time.